when that one happens, the human species is in real trouble. Tonight on 48 Hours. A threat to your life you can't even see. Most of the viruses that we're talking about here are readily infectious by just breathing in the air. You die of blood clots and hemorrhages at the same time. Deadly viruses <laughs> emerging from the jungle. We have to be aware that there are other viruses like AIDS out there, and that's what we're after. New killers. Ebola virus is a monster. As close as your own backyard. <laughs> For the first time, this virus had literally been brought home. There's a lot of hysteria right now. Half the rats have coronavirus. No vaccine. People have been exposed. We, we feared the worst. No treatment. I would have been in the isolation ward. No cure. If you got sick, you could start measuring for the pine box. <laughs> Things are out there. Are we ready for the next plague? I cannot imagine the kind of panic it's going to produce in this society. Imagine a world where infectious disease has run amok, where there are no pills, no shots, no cures for lethal viruses spreading everywhere, where each of us is powerless against a terrifying killer. It sounds like a horror movie, but experts say that horror could come true, and soon. Why do we face this deadly new threat, decades after the U.S. Surgeon General all but announced the end of infectious disease in this country? and? What do we have to fight back? Tonight, we bring you some answers as we step out of the world we know and into the danger zone. Down this hallway, behind these walls, are some of the world's deadliest killers. Killers with names like Marburg, Machupo, Houdin, and Ebola. They are newly discovered viruses. Viruses for which there's no vaccine. These things that you told me about are considered worse than AIDS? Oh, yes. No treatment. Most of the viruses that we're talking about here are readily infectious by the aerosol route. And no cure. Just breathing, breathing in the air. Peter Jarling is the senior research scientist here at the United States Army's Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, nicknamed USAMRID. Almost all of the most dangerous viruses Jarling studies were unknown two decades ago. So this is the BL4 lab. Uh, the most yes, lethal ones are BL4 only lab. studied in a BL4 lab. So these things are both highly contagious and often fatal. That's correct. BL stands for biosafety level. That material probably contains about 10 to 100 million virus particles per milliliter. And at USAMRID, level four is as high and as hot as it gets. You've got uh, hundreds of thousands of lethal doses of virus that you're holding in your hand. You want to go in here and work. What do you have to do? Okay, you go through the outer change room where you take off your street clothes, put on a scrub suit, put on your personal protective suit or what we call a, a spacesuit. Enter the BL4 side through the spacesuit shower. There's a germicide, a disinfectant in there, which is used to, uh, to disinfect the outside of the, uh, the spacesuit. Upon uh, entering this area, you want to put on uh, an extra layer of uh, rubber boots and, and you're good to go. Look at that. One of the nastiest BL4 viruses, man, they're loaded, is Ebola. Ebola virus is a monster. It's a true monster. Author Richard Preston is writing a book on dangerous viruses, including Ebola. It's a paradoxical condition where you both die of blood clots and you die of massive hemorrhages at the same time. I use the term biological meltdown. 
Man, is that all extracellular? Nancy Jacks, chief of pathology at USAMRID, got the scare of her life while dissecting monkeys who had died of Ebola. Their blood was loaded with the virus. I looked down and I had a big hole in my glove. <laughs> so it was a, a scary thing. Scary because days before she had cut herself on the palm. Uh, you kind of feel this clenching in your stomach and you go, oh my. <laughs> the cut had not healed yet. I would have been in the isolation ward. The isolation ward is where she would have gone most likely to die. Okay, they're ready to go? Around you, Samrid, it has a nickname. All right, we're ready when they're ready. The Slammer. Why would anybody refer to it as the Slammer? Well, because we're going to lock them down physically and probably a, a little bit emotionally because... Literally slamming them in here. We're, we're actually sealing the doors. This is a demonstration of how the isolation team would handle a lab worker like Nancy Jacks or anyone else who is even possibly infected with a BL4 virus. We would pick the person up, we would put them in the isolator, we would seal it. Major Mark Bither heads the unit. We would transport them through that port into this high containment area, into the waiting staff already in their blue suits. As it turned out, Nancy Jacks was not infected, never had to go to the slammer. The 20 cases that have been admitted were all false alarms. But experts warn, don't expect that luck to hold. Things are out there. Things are going to happen. Virologist Carl Johnson. Uh, we're going to be so unprepared the day one of them lands on our shores and takes off that I cannot imagine the kind of panic it's going to produce in this society. What if a virus appeared that was much more infectious than AIDS? How would it be handled? We couldn't possibly develop a vaccine for it in time. There would be no defense against it. And if you get it, you're going to give it to me just if I come into the same room with you. When that one happens, if that one happens, yeah, the human species is in real trouble. Scientists say that day may be closer than they feared because of what they found in a suburb of Washington, D.C. That story, when we come back. In anywhere USA. Rest in Virginia, a nice place to live. Good schools, pricey homes, and Ebola. Ebola is a virus, but not just any virus. A strain of it broke out in the winter of 1990 in this building in Northern Virginia. The building has been abandoned ever since. People would panic if they knew what Ebola does to people. There would have been panic. Most people never had heard of the Ebola incident until Richard Preston wrote an article for the New Yorker. 20th Century Fox now is making that report into a movie. There's a sense of horror about this agent, this living thing, which can get into you. And when it does get into you, it does absolutely extraordinary things to the human body. You die in ways that are almost unimaginable. The first outbreak of the virus came in 1976, near the Ebola River in Zaire. Doctor, where is he? He said that I take you. HBO portrayed it this way in And the Band Played On. You get a bad headache. Then you get sick to your stomach. Your blood begins to clot. Clots which lodge in your brain, lodge in your lungs, lodge in your intestines. And then the rest of your blood then becomes like the blood of a hemophiliac, loses its ability to clot, and streams out of all the orifices of your body, including your eyes, including the nipples of men. And so essentially your entire body becomes a kind of an oozing, melting mass of virus. The African incident was the last time anyone saw Ebola until a shipment of monkeys like this one came to the U.S. in late 1989. The monkeys came from the Philippines and went to the Hazelton Research Primate Quarantine Unit in Reston, Virginia. I got a call from this laboratory in Virginia. The veterinarian in charge said, I think I've got some simian hemorrhagic fever. His monkeys were dying. And his monkeys were dying. 
When tissue samples arrived at USAMRID... This is a flask actually a little larger than the one we used. Peter Jarling agreed with Hazelton's vet that they were probably dealing with a common monkey virus. He began some routine tests to make sure. Since you thought this couldn't affect people, were you working at that point in the spacesuit? No, we were not wearing a spacesuit. Oh, I got a nice one for you right here. To better study the virus, he tried to grow it in healthy cells. These are just normal uh, tissue culture cells. But something and, uh, went wrong. In, in one of the flasks, we had something similar uh, to what you see here. If you look closely, you can see there's some, uh, call it gunk, floating in there. When what we happened? suspected that the flask was uh, contaminated with bacteria, a common technique is to simply remove the top and to waft your hand over it like this. And there's a very pronounced smell of uh, grape juice. Grape juice? Of grape juice. And that signifies? Common bacterium that slips past our antibiotics. So you took a giant whiff of this stuff just to see? Well, I, let it, I wafted it past my face. I don't know how much I inhaled. Once? Um, maybe twice. But there was no grape juice smell, and Jarling was puzzled. I suppose in hindsight, they should have taken it directly into level four in spaces. But how could they have known? And this thing, the, the sample that came to them, hadn't killed anybody, came from a monkey, not a human being. There was no reason to think that it was a lethal virus. Actually, as small as that section is that you see there, in that whole section, there could be billions of virus particles, uh, millions and millions anyway. <laughs> Nancy Jacks was looking for what was wrong with the monkeys, too. But she was looking at pieces of tissue under an electron microscope. Okay, and here you see one right here. This one is, what? This is a, a whole cluster of virus particles right here. Scientists can photograph what the microscope sees. In the middle of all this, finally you get a picture. That's right, and the picture really scared us because it was clearly a filovirus. There's nothing else in the world that looks like a filovirus. So filovirus, as you knew it then, included only viruses that essentially kill people. Yes, that's correct. I think the reaction was like throwing a rock into a bee's nest. That place went crazy. These people are military biohazard experts. They know what level four agents can do to people. And they were scared. What was the atmosphere in that room? Tense, very tense, because we all recognized that we were at perhaps the, the beginning of a major outbreak. Of, an, of lethal disease in the United States. So at that point, no one worked with the virus any longer outside of a BL4 lab wearing a spacesuit. Their tests soon confirmed Ebola. I named Ebola. It didn't exist yet. Carl Johnson is one of the only scientists in the world ever to actually see an outbreak of Ebola. He was in Zaire in 1976. There was absolute fear and panic that Andromeda had finally occurred. It was close to 90% fatal. If you got sick, you could start measuring for the pine box right now. I have to say to you, I was shit scared. For the first time, this virus had, had literally been brought home. And you gotta realize there was a real sense of urgency here. We were working uh, long hours well into the night. These monkeys, they were in airplanes, they were on trucks. <laughs> A lot of people had been exposed. We, we thought that if we could get on top of this quickly, we might be able to contain um, an outbreak. Did you expect an outbreak at that point? We feared the worst. You go, ooh. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's pretty heavy. And something else Certainly. was adding that's to that. their fear. What made it clear in Reston that this could go through the air? Well, they, it, animals were continuing to die. It was continuing to be spread, and there was no other way for it to, to, to get it. I mean, and Peter certain. Jarling well knew what that could mean for him. What in the world went through your mind? I mean, you had actually sniffed a flask that now you find out what was in sure, there. Sure, I got a little shot of adrenaline, and, and yes, I worried. But uh, this is no job for a hypochondriac. I mean, Jarling was feeling healthy, but the monkeys at Hazelton Research were dying by the dozens. The company allowed the army to take over its building and kill the remaining animals in an effort to keep the virus from spreading. My group was the most vulnerable, there's no doubt about that. Colonel Gerald Jacks, the head of USAMRID's veterinary division and Nancy Jacks' husband, ran the operation. Did, did you ever wonder as you were driving over to this place, um, driving by houses 
and these people have no idea what's going on in that building. Yeah, that was a concern, but the decision was made that we didn't want to arrive in spacesuits and create a panic situation in a, in a suburb of, uh, of Washington. But by the time they did arrive to start their work, there was disturbing news. One of the monkey handlers was sick. We were told that there was an employee who had exhibited some flu-like symptoms. And because that's one of the clinical signs of Ebola, it certainly heightened our, uh, our resolve. They knew what that virus was, and they understood the danger to the suburban population of Washington. Over a period of days, the team killed close to 500 monkeys. They had to give these monkeys lethal injections. And a needle can easily penetrate a spacesuit. And if the needle happens to have a little bit of Ebola blood on it, you're dead. They sealed the building and decontaminated it by flooding it with formaldehyde gas. And I think everybody in our team had that same sort of feel. But uh, it's kind of an alien feel. When the team was done, the Army was convinced nothing, not even Ebola virus, was left alive. But what about the people already exposed? One of the early signs of this disease is fever, a high fever. And, um, and I took my temperature. You did? Sure I did. Every day until you were sure? Twice a day. His temperature never changed. He never got sick at all. The animal caretaker who had the flu symptoms apparently really did have the flu. Although tests showed he and several other workers were infected with the Ebola virus, mysteriously, no one got sick. None of them developed disease. Why not? Well, for reasons that we don't begin to understand. Th this virus will turn on itself and form what we call shepherd's crooks. Or All they know for sure is that this is a new strain of Ebola, deadly to monkeys, but apparently harmless to humans. They named it Ebola Reston. Even now, if you had Ebola Zaire, the kind that kills mm -hmm. people, next to Ebola Reston, the kind that doesn't, could you look in this Cannot microscope and tell? No. This is a negative stain of the Reston virus. The and harmless by, one, the, the one that doesn't one. kill people. Right. And by comparison, this is a similar preparation of um, Ebola Zaire. These viruses are indistinguishable. There's no way to understand what the difference is. That's right. You just touched on one of the great mysteries. There's no way that you can tell which virus is going to be virulent and which one is not. We were just lucky. Yes, we were. Could it happen again? Sure it could. Especially since we don't know how it got to that primate facility in the first place. Ebola is cycling in some unknown reservoir of animals somewhere in the world. We have not seen the last of Ebola. Ebola will be back. seemingly endless miles of rainforest. And in this wilderness, a baffling medical mystery. At its center is the Stone Age Nduga tribe. They called me Nduga Mende, which means one of the Ndugas. This is for Wam. Wam, Wam is a pig. Missionaries stumbled on these people only about 30 years ago. A minute. Uh, and they, they kill people with a tourist. Until recently. They really, really appreciate uh, having uh, people come in from the outside. They were the only outsiders the Ndugas ever had encountered. As you can see, we are very far away from anywhere in the world here. But on this day, another outsider is on his way here. I'm not the person to sit a lab bench or in an office. I'd rather be outside, and, and that's where I consider the action is. Coming because there's evidence that among this ancient people <laughs> lurks a virus new to medical science. So far, no one knows exactly what the virus is, where it came from, or how it spreads. I think for a research scientist, 
the opportunities are endless. Ron Anthony is an immunologist working for the U.S. Navy in Indonesia. And uh, shed some light on possibly new emerging diseases that are coming out of the rainforest in this part of the world. He's flying thousands of miles. You look from horizon to horizon, you see nothing but beautiful rainforest as far as you can see. Over several days. Uh, I've been making the trip about every four months. All part of the Navy's effort to keep tabs on illnesses that could affect U.S. troops. <laughs> how would you describe where we are? Well, I think we've gone back in history. I don't know how many thousands this year, I guess we could say. I think it may be best for me to, if, if I'm in the sun, because I'm going to need some light. And I think this will be fine. Anthony is here to get blood samples from the Induga. They come in here and register with name and number. Hoping for more clues. We can't isolate the virus. We can't match it up with anything at this point. You'd have to say right now that this looks like nothing anybody's seen before. That's right. Nice clean finger. How many people will you see today? <sighs> Till I get tired. They would keep coming. If I sat here till 8 o'clock tonight, they would keep coming. I tell you, uh, usually about 100 is my limit. So far, all Anthony knows for sure is that the virus is an unusual type called a retrovirus. <laughs> the most well-known retrovirus is HIV, AIDS. Okay, hobbies. It has to be stressed that though a relative of the AIDS virus, the virus found here has not caused any obvious symptoms. At least not yet. So why are you worried about it? What difference well, does it make if it doesn't hurt anybody? Well, maybe not today, but it could tomorrow. If you were working in Central Africa in the 1970s, you may have discovered HIV-1 in monkeys, and somebody might say to you, well, why are you concerned about a monkey, monkey virus? I mean, why are you concerned? Well, now I think that we have evidence as to why we should be concerned. After two days of drawing blood, we know that the retrovirus is there. We know that retroviruses change quite rapidly. <laughs> Anthony returns to the lab. And HIV, or the AIDS virus, obviously changed quite rapidly from monkey to man. Uh -huh. OK, how did it get from monkey to man? We don't know how it got from monkey to man, but obviously that virus changed somewhere along the way in order to make that leap. Just make sure that a driver is there between 2.30 and 3 o'clock tomorrow. And uh... we have to be aware of the fact that there are other viruses like AIDS out there in the rainforest or wherever, that can make that same leap. Ron Anthony looks at what he's seeing here among the Indugas as an early warning signal. And I think that we'd be very naive and foolish to sit around waiting for it to occur in Philadelphia when we can possibly identify it while it's still in the rainforest, and that's what we're after. You think there are more? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> And this one already is spreading outside the Induga villages. More on that later in our 48 hours. Go on out and check some traps. Biologist Gregory Gory Glass Nothing. is caught up in a serious game open. of cat and mouse. No, he's open. Nothing. Sometimes you get the mouse and sometimes the mouse gets you. Sometimes the virus gets you, too. And you definitely don't want to get this virus. Yep, it's a deer mouse. It's a virus carried by rats and mice. They're really pretty animals. A very deadly virus called the hunter virus. The race is on tonight to solve an alarming medical mystery, a fast-developing flu-like illness that has claimed at least 10 lives in the Southwest. Remember last summer when a respiratory infection killed dozens of people on or near Navajo land? I think that we're dealing with something that may be contagious, but we don't know for sure. It was a respiratory disease that killed young, healthy people, filling their lungs with fluid. I ask that our people remain calm, Faced with an outbreak that seemed to be spreading and without a clue as to what was causing it, New Mexico health officials sought federal help. We didn't know what it was. We thought it was something new. Dr. C.J. Peters at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. We don't know whether if it's an infectious disease, it's a bacterium, a virus, a mycoplasma, you name it. So this is, we're starting at zero and we all think it's a new disease. Bio levels high at this point. 
Fear level is high. People are dying. The CDC sent out researchers to the southwest. So these field people were working with the states to get samples back here that we could then analyze in the lab. Just a few days into the testing, they found the answer. It turned out that it was a hantavirus. Scientists knew about a strain of hantavirus that caused outbreaks in Europe and Asia. During the Korean War, it struck 3,000 UN soldiers. But this was the first time they had identified a strain of virus that caused a large outbreak in North America. Where did it come from? We suspect the viruses have been here for a very long time. The reason that we haven't found them before is that we haven't looked for them. The, the, the epidemic in New Mexico is what made the difference. And that may have been triggered by changes in the environment. There was a big year for deer mouse populations. In the southwest, the hunter virus is carried by the common deer mouse. There was a lot of rain last year, which created an abundant food supply for the mice. As one of the uh, rodent trappers put it, the mice are numerous, the grass is tall, and the coyotes are fat. And the southwest is not the only place scientists are finding the hunter virus. How many hunter viruses are there? It grows every day, and uh, the odds are that as we look for more, we're going to find more. And as our recognition of hunter virus has grown, so has Guri Glass's frequent flyer mileage. You know, but this sort of habitat that we're looking for. Two days after a hunter virus investigation in Kansas, Guri Glass is in Idaho. Yeah, I've got four underneath the house. Working around the clock. It'll go until it gets done, which will probably be one or two this morning. Investigating the cause of another hunter virus death. And that was the 14th, right, that Dine died? Mm-hmm. Janice Geary's 14-year-old son, Dine, died in October. See any rodents during the daytime? Yes. How many rodents did you capture in that two-month period of time? Oh, geez, 40? We sit and talk with as many people as we can and find out where the person might have yeah, been. About the time that you spent with Dine. And you set traps there. Oh, I'm getting too old for this stuff. You love it. Do we know how this particular virus is transmitted? It's transmitted directly in through the air uh, from people coming in contact with infected droppings. I'm just seeing if there are many any droppings down here. And actually, it's really pretty clean. But we did OK the other places. The next step in identifying the virus is taking blood samples from the mice. Everybody got two pairs on, gloves? Yep. We don't expect to make mistakes. On the other hand, okay, this is wood line. if you make one, you'd rather it not okay. be a real yeah, serious one. But there is a mistake. You know, you try and build as many redundant systems into it. Two pairs of gloves, anesthetized animal. <laughs> and yet, they bit me. It's a sure way to become infected if the mouse is a carrier. These are the blood specimens from the mice. He'll have to wait for the lab results. These go down to CDC Atlanta. So we'll mark the animal. We know which one it was. Hi, Maji. This is Greg. He doesn't tell his wife about the bite. They're moving up the trip. Only about a change of plans. I got to go to Miami. Well, County to prevent do my best to kids. Any further outbreak of hantavirus. As Action News told you, the virus carried by rats was just confirmed in South Dade yesterday. Gurry Glass is on his way to Miami because of what happened to Ken Spence. I woke up, I was freezing, my teeth were chattering. I'd never been that cold before, and I've been up north, but I'd never been that cold before. It was a hunter virus infection. Four days later, Spence went into a coma. It's a new hantavirus. We're looking, I'm, I'm hunting for a new hantavirus. See the housing right there? Yeah. Boy, that was a heck of a storm. Again, the problem may be the environment. Yeah, this is what I'm looking for, yeah. The aftermath of Hurricane Andrew, an exploding rat population. In this area, sort of southern Florida, there may be 10, 12 different species of rodents. Yeah, these are probably rice rats down in here. Some of which may be infected with the hantavirus, most of which will not be. Before the Florida lab results come in... Tests are underway to find the source of the deadly hantavirus that killed a Long Island man. News of another death in New York. Does that tell you that this virus is, is spreading across the country? I suspect it's not spreading across the country. I suspect the virus or viruses actually have been widespread for years. I think we'll probably see in, in the years uh, to come probably isolated cases and perhaps sometimes when the environmental conditions get right as happened in the Four Corners area this summer we might see a large number of cases. We're gonna have to change the way we think about rodents, and we're going to have to learn more about this before we know how big a problem we're, we're really dealing with. 77. It turns out that in Miami, the carrier is the cotton rat. And what about the mice from Idaho? Two out of 14 mice tested positive for hunter virus.
but not the mouse that bit Gurry Glass. I was lucky, and sometimes it pays to be lucky. But we are going to need more than luck to fight some everyday illnesses. Why is it that some of the drugs we've used for years no longer work? The surprising answer to that, when we return. People are out there moving earth, moving forests, moving vast uh, pieces of uh, the land into uh, new arrangements. And humans have to adapt to that. And as humans attempt to adapt to that, they will very likely experience new diseases. Medical anthropologist Carol Jenkins hopes to head off those new diseases. Small changes in the ecological settings of remote places end up very often affecting the whole world. Jenkins and her research team are working in remote rainforest areas of Papua New Guinea. Now, Miss Abby, you know got water close to Long House in Hot. Monitoring the health of the villagers there. They have been here for many decades. They've been in the general area for many centuries. But the logging here is new. Now, our concern is that if everything shifts, you might start to get more killers. You might start to get new ones. And if you get new ones that no one's had before, the people have no resistance, they will really feel it. It will be a disaster. It's a Hercules moth, one of the larger moths in the world. The researchers are tracking the environmental changes in the area. Sphinx moth. And focusing on any medical consequences that may result. We'll be putting some light traps in houses and also in the forests. One big concern, new illnesses carried by mosquitoes. Mosquitoes have been very important in uh, transmission of uh, viruses. What we're watching very carefully for is increasing densities of mosquitoes that were never here. So we get the light trap not just above their heads, so but at night when they lay there and mosquitoes come to feed, of them, feed on them, the mosquitoes will be caught in this light trap and they will collect that tomorrow morning. If you take this system and you disturb it, you bring in machines that leave lots of holes in the ground where water can accumulate. There's lots of mosquitoes, and there's lots of new mosquitoes. Oh, this is new. The last time I was here, I didn't notice that road. It's a new one. And that could cause a great deal of uh, sickness to these people. So you come here one time, it's all forests, and then three weeks later you come, there's a big road like it's happened now and I've lost my way altogether. It is possible that you could have outbreaks of fatal things. The world certainly has seen that before. New diseases popping up thanks to mankind. Now, high up the River Nile at Aswan. After completion of the Aswan Dam in Egypt, a disease called Rift Valley Fever emerged. Carried by mosquitoes, it killed many people in the region and left many more blind. Another killer, Lassa fever, showed up in Sierra Leone after diamond mining began in virgin parts of that country. And some scientists believe population explosions in Africa brought man and animal together in a way that contributed to the transformation of a harmless monkey virus into AIDS. What happened with AIDS haunts immunologist Ron Anthony. Remember that back in Indonesia, he is still trying to identify the mysterious virus he's found in the Stone Age in Dugas. Certainly these people in, in these highland valleys and these primitive tribes have been exposed all their lifetime to primitive infectious agents that we probably haven't seen. The fact that none of the Indugas is sick doesn't comfort him much what's occurring in these people, and they live with all their lives very comfortably. If it happens to you and me, we're going to become very sick. It's one thing to talk theoretically about finding a new virus. It's quite something else again to actually be able to watch one spread. But that's what scientists think they are seeing here. We're going to RSO 11. On this day, Anthony is hundreds of miles from the Indugas. He's heading to another village, where, mysteriously, he also has found the virus. 
a village called Arso 11. Uh, it's a transmigrant camp. Arso 11 is part of Indonesia's transmigration program to move families out of squalid urban slums and into newly created towns. This is the entrance to Arso. It's cut right out of the middle of the rainforest. This camp has been open for just over a year. Hey. And in that time, the same mystery virus has started infecting the newcomers here. We actually met them at the airport the night that they came in, and uh, obviously... Take tests right there? Yes, absolutely. We took the blood the night they arrived. So you knew they didn't get off the plane with it? That's right, absolutely. And all of those, all of those uh, bloods that we tested when they got off the plane are negative. And three months later? Three to six months later, we can have 25, 35 percent positive for these antibodies yeah this is what i want let's see here anthony's goal today yeah, if we could get these 10 over here within the next hour or so with case histories and blood samples is to figure out why it is spreading <laughs> after all no one here has had any contact with the indugas we don't know where it's coming from at this point i think we can say that whatever it is, uh, it's transmitted very rapidly, but I think that uh, it's just another example of something perhaps emerging in the tropics, emerging in the tropical rainforest, which although it's not causing a problem today, uh, it could very easily cause a problem five, 10 years from now. And there's no telling how far it could spread. Ah, diseases move very quickly. Hop on a plane with a person. It's not even hard for a disease to move. Diseases move with uh, great ease. Number one, something no. Which is why Carol Jenkins agrees with Ron Anthony. It's crucial to be aware of emerging diseases anywhere. No nation can be immune to new and very serious uh, disease patterns. If the AIDS epidemic isn't showing that to the United States, I don't know what could. How do you screen out microbiota that come in people or animals? With what? With a net over the states? Johnson, at home in Vienna, Virginia, is a sweet, good-natured toddler. Can you put him in the basket? He may be the apple of his mother's eye but he's a pediatrician's nightmare. He is one of my most difficult patients. Every practice has a Travis. Actually, it's not Travis at all who's causing the problem. It's what's inside him. <coughs> Bacteria the doctors just can't kill. Kids get ear infections, but since we got the first one, we basically haven't been out of the doctor's office. Ear infections are, if you will, our bread and butter. Dr. Richard Schwartz is Travis's pediatrician. Whatever we threw at that child, whatever antibiotic, the best that we have, the most broad spectrum that we have, uh, while the child might have improved temporarily, taken off the antibiotic, flared up again. Um, and then we take him into the doctor the next day and his ears are bulging with another infection. We had the eardrum lanced. We gave shots of a, a powerful antibiotic called Rocephin. Um, nothing seems to be effective. Nothing was working because the bacteria that invaded Travis's ear, common pneumococcus, had developed into sort of a superbug that was resistant to the antibiotics that doctors regularly use to cure ear infections. It's real hard, but it's one of those things, you know, what do you do at this point? The only thing left to do was to insert tiny tubes in Travis's ears a surgical procedure that almost always ends ear infections. Tubes are supposed to solve the problem. Right. Did it with Travis? No. The pneumococcus bacteria are the most common cause of pneumonia in this country and behind about half of the ear infections. So the idea that something like that could become drug resistant is very frightening. Doctors originally thought the problem was just confined to a few states. That's no longer the case. We know that in our area and in many areas in the southeastern United States, a large number of the bacteria that cause middle ear infections have built up a resistance to the commoner antibiotics. What are these miraculous substances that kill bacteria? We call them antibiotics. Antibiotics are chemical substances produced by microbes, which tend to inhibit the growth of other microorganisms and even kill them. This myth of the 
antibiotics as miracle drugs cause them to be grossly misused. For more than 20 years, Dr. Stuart Levy of Tufts University School of Medicine has been studying how bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. You treat a patient with an antibiotic and you kill off all the bacteria that are susceptible. If there's a rare bacterium that is not killed, it has all this space to come back. And now, instead of having one in 100 million resistant, you now have 100 million resistant. In other words, the more antibiotics are used, the easier it is for the resistant bacteria to survive. Eventually, the drugs become useless. Those who are demanding antibiotics have to know that there's a consequence, not only to themselves, but to society, uh, by misusing these drugs. Because it is clearly misuse and overuse that is leading to this situation. To see just how easy it is to get antibiotics, we sent a hidden camera and a 48-hour staffer who had just been given a clean bill of health by her own doctor into three medical clinics in suburban New Jersey. In each clinic, the staffer told the same story. Like three days. Three days. And I've been feeling like just really achy. Symptoms experts say might indicate a cold or the flu and do not warrant an antibiotic. But our staffer wanted a prescription. I mean, I've had it where I've taken an antibiotic and it's, and it's cleared up. Two of the doctors gave her exactly what she asked for. Why don't you come on out and put you on a little amoxicillin, okay? The third doctor did not. Unfortunately, the flu, there's no antibiotic that's necessarily going to be effective in working for this. The next day, we returned to talk with one of the doctors who had prescribed the antibiotics. People want a magic pill, and they think the antibiotic is the magic pill. So who do you think is most at fault, the doctors or the patients who come in? I think the patients who come in. But there would be some people who watch us and say, wait a minute, you're the doctor. Yes, but like I said also, this is a business as well. If you keep being nasty to patients, they're not nasty, but you keep refusing patients, they're not going to come back. While the situation in doctor's offices is seldom life-threatening, it can be a different story in the hospital. Take the case of Frank Hacker. This 76-year-old sailed through a triple bypass, but a common staphylococcus infection that later developed in his leg is what's keeping him in Buffalo's VA Medical Center. The unique thing about his infection is that this particular strain of staph is resistant to all antibiotics except vancomycin. Frank's doctor, Thomas Beam, is a noted infectious disease specialist. So what you're saying to me, really, in this case, is without vancomycin, you don't have anything else. Right. Anything that's really practical. Right. Is that frightening to you as a doctor? That's very frightening, yes. And doctors are fearful that vancomycin is losing its effectiveness. How soon do you think we may end up with a strain that doesn't even respond to vancomycin? Um, it's purely a guess, but it could happen within the next one to five years. We are looking at bacteria that for decades we know, or centuries we know, have caused human disease, where we've had a brief window of opportunity to treat that disease successfully, and now we're returning to a period of time where there may not be anything available. We've got to come up with new ways of using antibiotics. We've got to come up with some new antibiotics and we sure better use them wisely so we don't lose them quickly because this is not something that's going to go away. We're always going to have to be ahead of the game. As the threat of infectious disease seemed to disappear in the last 20 years, science shifted much of its money and time into fighting chronic illnesses such as heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Now the experts say the warning signs are clear. We have to turn our attention back to fighting viruses and developing antibiotics before it's too late. I'm Dan Rather, and that's 48 Hours. Coming up next, your late local news. Eye to Eye will be here tomorrow night. Now here's a look ahead to our next report. He came in the basement window and straight up the stairs and knew it was great. One night of terror. She thought she was going to die. One man accused. It's ready. I don't have any doubt. But is he the right man? She couldn't identify. I wouldn't be here if I had any doubt. It's not good news. Shred of evidence. 
We're still talking about a tiny amount of DNA. She may be right. She could be wrong. Next week. <laughs> Stay with us for a whole lot of fun on tonight's Late Show with David Letterman. Dave welcomes Mia Farrow, singer Tim McGraw, and more coming up later. Mark McEwen here. Thanks for making CBS America's most watched television network. Now, your local news. For a transcript of this program, send $6 to 48 Hours Transcripts, Box 7, Livingston, New Jersey, 07039. And to order a VHS cassette of tonight's broadcast, call 1-800-338-4847. Experience CBS News.